All right, everyone, welcome back to another Geopolitical Futures podcast. I am Jacob Shapiro. Joining me today is a special guest, uh, Andrei Sushentsov. He is the program director of the Valdai Club Foundation. He is the head of the Laboratory of International Trends Analysis at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, which is where his PhD is from. He's also the founder and head of the Eurasian Strategies Group. Um, Andre, thanks for making the time to talk to us. It's really great to have you here. Jacob, thank you for this opportunity. It's good to be here. Um, it's funny. Uh, I emailed Andre about what two weeks ago to invite him onto the podcast, and I think it was maybe the next day or two days later uh, that the U.S. NATO ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchinson made her remarks that the U.S. might have to yes. take out russian missiles uh, but the the, <laughs> the the point of this podcast was to talk about u.s russia relations and how there's kind of a an, a communication problem an unintelligibility between the united states and russia that people don't really get to seem to cut through so i think it's a particularly time a good time for us to be having this conversation andre and the first question that i would pose to you for a lot of our listeners who are mostly english speakers and a lot of whom are in north america are is is to ask you what do you think Americans and English speakers don't understand about Russia? What is the number one thing that they just don't seem to get? Well, I will start with the general perception that Russians are a European people who are for some reason somehow different and don't uh, you know, fit in the, the general picture or perception um, uh, of a being a normal European people. So everybody expects Russians to be um, on the same page, page mentally, on the same page uh, in terms of values, and on the same page in terms of perceptions, which um, doesn't really work because uh, Russians, uh, although being a European nation, you get a clear sense that you're European being a Russian when you say cross the border near Vladivostok to China or North Korea, you instantly feel yourself European. But um, Russians have very strong uh, identity, which is pretty much particular. And um, this identity has been formed for several centuries in uh, uh, living in this uh, very particular geography of huge Eurasian plain. So this, uh, this rather big still uh, Slavic nation have uh, developed a particular views about stability, which they favor much more than you know, promotion of freedom. Uh, they developed a view about security, which they value much more than opportunity. And uh, uh, in different international situations and crises, we have a collision of these views, so where Russians um, see that you know evasion into Libya or Iraq or like anywhere in the Middle East would cause more problems than opportunities. Um, we don't generally get the appreciation of these views. So Russians, you know, throughout history, they developed this kind of... Um, historical pessimism, uh, that they don't expect something, you know, something of opportunity to come up from a dramatic change, particularly violent change. And uh, this uh, cultural dynamism is uh, not that easy to grasp. You actually need to spend like hundreds of hours with a fellow Russian drinking and eating and, uh, you know, living together to get to the ground of this uh, value um, um, asymmetry, I would put it. And um, I think Russians also have their own, you know, uh, problem in getting the Westerners, Americans, first of all. Um, first, like we, as everybody else, uh, tend to transplant our own views on everybody else. So since we are generally, you know, pessimists, realists, uh, see more of a, uh, you know, challenge than an opportunity and a dramatic change, we tend to see that Americans are also, you know, they are realists, they are strategists, they don't do mistakes, particularly stupid mistakes, and they have a strategy for everything. So, uh, say, when I teach for a master's students at my university in Gimo University, uh, I always tackle the same problem every year with every new group. I ask them a question, and that is the course on American foreign policy. I ask them a question, uh, does the United States make mistakes in, in foreign policy? And uh, the group uh, spends, you know, a few moments to, to, to ponder. And then almost everybody say, no, never. There is a plan for everything. There is a strategy. No blunders ever happened with the United States. They could not, you know, reach this, this influence in world affairs. And uh, it is really hard to, you know, to, to explain here to people that uh, all of us are human. All of us are imperfect. Uh, you know, human nature is everywhere 
the same and uh, you know we tend to do to do mistakes and uh, if you're a power like the united states your mistakes can be really big and can cost a lot so i think this is uh, where we actually uh, see it in terms of the asymmetry of, of, of perception yeah i think that one of the the biggest differences and and maybe you'll correct me if i'm wrong but a lot of the times when i think about political power in russia i think about it concentrated mostly in moscow so like you said russia is this incredibly diverse really huge federation encompassing so many different viewpoints that a lot of people in the West don't really realize. But at the same time, Moscow really is the economic, political center of everything that's going on in a way that in the United States, I'm sure that the Trump administration would like people to think that all the decisions are happening in Washington. And certainly politicians want everyone to think that the most important things are happening in Washington. But authority in the United States is actually diffuse among a lot of different centers. If we're talking about economics and politics, you can get, you know, the type of thing where in a US, you know, budget statement where the politicians are talking, you can get an offhand reference to maybe developing um, more missile defense areas in Eastern Europe, and maybe even outfitting those missile defense platforms for offensive weapons, when you know, the State Department or the, the diplomatic side knows that if you said that to Russia or to any Russian official, they would look at you crazy because that violates the INF Treaty, which is the thing that Hutchinson mm -hmm. was going on about in the first place. So like you said, there's this, there's in the United States, especially, there's a lot of disconnect between a lot of the policy making sectors. And I find that a lot of times people are looking for those threads of consistency. And a lot of times, the consistency isn't there. Um, do you think the same is true of Russia, or do you think that Russia is similarly diffused? A, a good example of this is um, when uh, recently, when Russia and Israel had their their little spat over that uh, Russian jet that went down in Syria. Um, it was it was kind of striking that the Russian military kept saying, "Well, no, the, what the Israelis are saying didn't happen here. We're not happy about this. We're going to ship those S three hundreds to Syria as soon as possible," whereas. Vladimir Putin was saying, okay, like this is an accident. I can maybe accept some of what the Israelis are saying. Do you think that in Russia there's a similar disconnect sometimes or similar competition between different uh, competing political factions? Or should we think of it more as Moscow is on the same page? I think that power is much more centralized in Russia than it is in the United States. And this is also a cognitive problem for many people here to grasp how exactly you know, Trump being paralyzed by establishment and uh, that the Congress even being in the hands of the Republicans, the same party the president is, um, on many questions acts uh, independently. This uh, is a challenge to, to, to get uh, uh, through for many people here. But uh, in, in uh, Moscow, it's not that, uh, you know, black and white picture either. Um, a lot of um, um, organizations inside the government have their own agendas and uh, you just cannot physically control anything what's going on in the country. It is a very diverse federation, 86 um, uh, regions inside. Uh, they are as diverse as, say, Chechnya and Maganan region and Kaliningrad in Europe and, uh, you know, Nahotka in the Far East. 11-hour belt uh, country, a continent-sized thing. So it's really hard to govern it from a, a single center. And... Um, uh, every country is an experiment, I, I, I would state, and Russia is still an experiment. Uh, quite successful, though, historically, it exists in these borders for three centuries already. Uh, but nevertheless, yes, there are you know different um, um, perspectives on, of how things can work and should work. The military guys, they almost everywhere tend to see um, the world in terms of the threats and not of, of opportunities. Uh, President. Putin, he um, has a personal contact with um, uh, Israel Prime Minister, and uh, I think that uh, personal chemistry is there, and uh, he gets that uh, it's a war, and um, uh, mistakes, miscalculations, and just accidents are happening there. So, uh, but nonetheless, like he could have blocked this uh, shipment of S three hundred, but he didn't, and uh, this means that uh, even though he is uh, empathetically. Um, um, negotiating with Israel, uh, he still doesn't see that uh, the activity that Israel is pursuing is uh, uh, non-threatening or, or somehow, you know, affecting Russian interests also. Mm -hmm. Switching gears just a little bit, one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past when we've had conversations is that there's this kind of Cold War hangover for not just everyday people, but also politicians and even officials in, on both sides, I would think in both the United States and Russia, that they can't seem to 
to adjust to the new power dynamics between the United States and Russia. Um, a lot of people you know, have this tendency to go back and think of Russia just in Cold War terms. And it's, it's destructive because you know, the Cold War really was a competition between two powers that were vying for, I would call it, global hegemony. But you know, Russia is not the Soviet Union anymore. Um, Russia is not playing on that same type of level. And the United States doesn't have any desire to compete on that kind of level at the same time. Despite that, uh, the U.S. and Russia find themselves at odds all over the world. Uh, U.S. and Russia seem to find themselves at odds in Syria, which has always been strange to me because the goals of the two sides there line up. Um, in Ukraine, the U.S. and Russia don't see eye to eye at all. And you have all of this talk now about a second Cold War. You know, For me, from a realist position or from a position that just looks at kind of the, the balance of power, it doesn't make sense that this should be happening. How, how, do, how do you explain it? How do you explain this degradation in U.S.-Russia relations at a time when they aren't competing at the same level that they were in, let's say, the 1970s and 1980s? Well, I would agree with you. There is a kind of a cognitive inertia in interpreting what is going on in the world. And since the elites uh, here in Russia and there in the United States, they, they for many years have been in the apex of the Cold War when people had the best hobby in confronting one another. So they are tending to interpret our current frictions as uh, like um, a chapter two of what we had there. I would uh, say that our current issues are not, it is not a Cold War. It is, uh, can be better described as a strategic competition. While the United States would like to maintain a position of having an access to any region it would like, while Russia also opting at uh, maintaining uh, strategic autonomy to be able to uh, fulfill its interest in the uh, near abroad and uh, in the regions where it sends that it has a vital interest, particularly in Syria. And uh, I think it's quite naturally that uh, these frictions arise. We still cannot um, coin a proper term to describe this competition. And the problem is also that uh, not only Russia and the United States are taking part in this competition. Um, China is there, India is there, Turkey is there. Israel actually a pretty um, active and uh, independent um, strategic player. Uh, European nations, uh, European Union at all, um, everybody are looking for an uh, independent, sovereign or, or strategically autonomous path in this uh, new environment, which is much more competitive um, in all scales. And uh, since there is a lot of, un a lot of uncertainties, uh, a lot of um, things which are happening which nobody predicted, like uh, you know, election results or revolts, mass uprisings, some dramatic economic or climatic events, um, we are still, you know, stuck in the old metaphors like a Cold War. And um, I, w I would say that this current state of affairs would be better called an uncertainty. And this doesn't mean that this uncertainty would, uh, at some point, would become a certainty. Uh, probably we are living like in a new norm of this uncertainty. And uh, like all politics becomes transactional. So the partner for this year is this country, for next year it can be other country. Yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. Would you, when you look at Russian foreign policy right now, would, would you describe it as inherently defensive in nature? Or do you think that Russia is trying to push, push further into some of those border regions that maybe in, in recent decades, it's lost some of its influence and power? Well, I think that Russia would like to have uh, its neighborly region as stable as, say, Finland, with whom Russia has a perfect um, uh, political economy and security relations, demilitarized border, mutual security assurances, neutrality. And uh, it doesn't want to, you know, to have all of its borderline to look like Ukraine or like Caucasus. Um, the thing is that uh, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it didn't resolve a lot of issues. Um, it wasn't supplemented with a comprehensive international legal regime. Um, and uh, basically, you know, few presidents decided that they would like this country to collapse. And uh, that was it. Um, so we basically, like the, the, the issues, the crisis that we have currently in Ukraine and elsewhere, they are the postponed crisis of the you know, Soviet Union collapse. If it would be a properly prepared, like say, uh, the Brexit negotiations with the European Union, even though they are messy, even though they are you know, dissatisfying, 
I would actually think that uh, Brits are, are, um, would like to have a deal rather than no deal. When you have a no deal, you actually pay away for much more problems in the future. What does, well, I don't want to say the word deal, but what does a, a stable Ukraine look like for Russia, if we can take an example? What, does it look like something like Finland? I mean, how, how would Russia view a, a positive development in the Ukrainian situation that would make it feel secure? Well, Russia f sees Ukraine as an internally divided country, uh, a country with uh, significant Russian minority. And um, Russia, of course, cannot stay silent and, you know, being passive when uh, this Russian minority is vocal that its rights are oppressed. Like it instantly becomes a question of internal political life in Russia. Imagine like Americans being in Mexico. United States collapse and California is in, or New Mexico is in Mexico now. And a few Americans who are there, they are, they are saying that Mexicans are not good to them. Um, so you either take those people out of Ukraine or you, which I see more properly, um, foster conditions for um, these divisions in Ukraine to, to become less acute. So first, this uh, in internal stabilization of Ukraine. And second, I think in terms of international security, Ukraine should become this uh, neutral country in the way Finland is. It doesn't mean to, comp to compromise uh, Ukrainian security, uh, but it would um, take out a significant bit of paranoia between Russia and NATO. And uh, I don't think that we have a structural premises for a major war in Europe. It's not a beginning of the 20th century. We don't need a land to fight for, um, but there's you know misperceptions or a different um, narratives about uh, how exactly the Cold War has ended and uh, what exactly you know the proper configuration of security in Europe. In a crisis like Ukraine, they are, I think, the closest one to a possible local hot hot uh, stage war. So we need to avoid this. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's hard to look at Ukraine because, I mean, it's not just Russia and the United States that are that are playing here, right? Um, Poland looks at Ukraine and, and has some ambitions there. Even a country like hun Hungary looks at Ukraine and has some has some ambitions there. Um, I wonder if you think that, do you think that Ukraine will still be within its current borders in, let's say, 10, 15 years time? Or do you think that there's going to be some kind of you know, recognition that there are going to be different parts of Ukraine that maybe will be under different sectors of control. That's completely hypothetical, but I wonder how you would react to that suggestion. Uh, well, I think uh, we should not, uh, you know, uh, underestimate the the um, stability of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the scenario of implosion, I would actually think that internal implosion is possible. And uh, this cultural divide, national divide inside Ukraine is pretty acute. Ukrainian politics is pretty uh, messy and actually um, non-constructive. Elites manipulating ethnical, religious, uh, you know, values, issues uh, much more in a way that actually produces violence. So I would not exclude a, a worst case scenario. I think it would be contrary to any Russian interests to have this scenario because it would become a constant um, uh, pain and constant uh, source of tensions. Russia would like to have a stable Ukraine, neutral Ukraine, and uh, internally at peace with itself. I would uh, see that as a, a best case scenario. The issue is that, you know, Ukrainian elites are trying to fix the country for all of the time of its independence. And uh, almost any election turns out to be a crisis and in the worst case scenario, an international crisis. So I don't think that they uh, need Russia to spoil things. They do it perfectly well by themselves. I want to turn to talk about Russia's role in Asia. But before we do that, I just want to stay in Europe for, for, one, more, for one more minute or two more minutes and talk about sure. Sure. the Balkans, um, where you've got not just the United States, but you've got the EU and NATO trying to recruit new members. Obviously, this whole name deal referendum with Macedonia is designed to try and integrate Macedonia into Western security structures. Uh, Montenegro is the most recent mm -hmm. NATO member. Uh, Serbia, Kosovo relations seem to be, you know, good one day, bad the next day, and all sides political grandstanding. Um, Russia obviously has some interests in the Balkans, especially with its relationships uh, with in particular Serbia, but also the Serbs that are living in Bosnia. Um, how, do, how does the Balkans fit into Russian strategy right now? Because it's a little further away from the border than you would think. 
and yet Russia still feels a need uh, to be on the ground there, probably influencing and, and exercising some power. So what is that Russian interest in the Balkans? And does Russia automatically interpret the U.S. push to integrate some of these Balkan countries into NATO as a potential threat? Well, I think the internal dynamic in the Balkans uh, can be interpreted in the metaphor of a vacuum, of a power vacuum. So this vacuum actually absorbs uh, influence from any major foreign power who would like to project uh, uh, influence there. Um, they draw Turks, they draw China, they draw Russia. I don't think that the Balkans is an actual um, place of geopolitical, uh, ground geopolitical competition, that we have some vital interest at stake, that Russia has a vital interest at stake in, in, in the Balkans. But since we have uh, this Russia-NATO security frontier, a moving border between our uh, two blocks, two um, countries, that is a um, major source of friction. And uh, this, this borderline, this moving borderline is uh, um, uh, a region where major conflicts arise. Uh, Balkans are, well, they can become this um, region of geopolitical competition, geopolitical confrontation. Russia doesn't like the NATO enlargement process it uh, always questions uh, exactly uh, uh, why are you enlarging against whom you're enlarging what is your essential goal there why wouldn't you dissolve yourself this uh, you know famous joke that um, ex-nato uh, general secretary rasmussen once asked vladimir putin how nato can help you uh, help how nato can help russia and and he responded uh, Easily, you can just dissolve yourself, and that is, you know, a proper way. We together with Americans, with um, Europeans, can discuss how the security in Europe should look like. So, um, in many, you know, critical eyes uh, here in Moscow, NATO enlargement process uh, is a uh, is a danger, is a pro actually a vital threat. We don't get a clue why exactly you spread a military alliance uh, in the absence of a military threat. Imagine that, say, Russia or China develops a military alliance in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America, and does not invite the United States to join this military alliance, say, at Cuba, Venezuela, or, say, Panama. And, um, uh, it, of course, it's not a, a reality, but uh, I think that people would, would be seeing this um, in, in a negative sense. And um, I, I don't think that we need this. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up China, and I think that's that's one of the most important things to talk about because, I mean, the United States has said that it views Russia and China as its two potential rival competitors. Uh, and the relationship between Russia and China is, for me, one of the most interesting to think about because, on the one hand, there's been a big show, I think, of, of a new closeness in relations between the two sides. Um, there were those big military exercises recently, and there's all kinds of talk about economic cooperation, and energy trade, and everything. And yet at the same time, I mean, you know, even when both were communist, when the Soviet Union and People's Republic of China were the two vanguards of global communism, they couldn't see eye to eye. China eventually ends up, you know, forming an alliance with the United States in the 1970s just because it's so afraid of what the Soviet Union is doing. Um, do you think, though, that we're in the type of position where both Russia and China are weaker than the United States, but that together, perhaps if they pool their resources, they can push back against the United States? Do you think that the United States' articulation of that threat pushes Russia and China together in a way? Or do you think that these obstacles to Russia-China cooperation that have been there through centuries of mistrust and various wars and border disputes, uh, is that the ultimate reality there? Well, I think that the uh, United States and the West in general, they are quite naturally pushing Russia and China together. Um, since Russia is facing the same security challenge uh, in, in Europe from the West as China facing this challenge in the um, Pacific Ocean and in the seas around it uh, from the United States. And uh, this, uh, uh, I, I can use a metaphor of two people standing back to back in this uh, uh, environment. There is uh, not that much trust between the two countries. Um, there, are, there is, I, I don't think, a, a lot of comprehension of uh, mutual values. There is no single value platform between them. And solidarity between them is basically based on the constant um, messaging on about the absence of the hostile intentions toward one another. Uh, 
-hmm. and understanding that now they are facing the same or parallel geopolitical challenge to both of them. And I think this is pretty naturally pushes them together. Um, it is quite striking, but in almost any of my conversation with an American colleague or European colleague, uh, my interlocutor asked me a question. Uh, do you understand that you, Russia, have an uh, actual friend in the United States and Europe, while China is your adversary? And uh, I respond with this joke or this proverb in Russian. Um, I would say it in Russian first. С такими друзьями врагов не нужно. With friends like this, you don't need enemies. So we we basically just don't get a message properly then. And um, this is not a friendly behavior. Uh, so and and this conclusion that eventually Russia would be, you know, forced by China to you know to to ask for the help from the West. I think it's a generally overstated uh, perception. Russia has a great history of strategic autonomy. It's pretty potent militarily and strategically and diplomatically. I actually think that, um, first, Russia would like to maintain strategically independent. It doesn't want to form uh, an alliance, a military alliance with China. But uh, the West can force it to sign this alliance. Um, if this pressure would continue, if this, you know, Grievances about European security and NATO enlargement, Ukrainian crisis, all this, you know, provocations, things, uh, chemical weapons, etc. This is pretty natural, you know, push against strategic interests of uh, both Russia, of course, but I think the West. This means that we will have this security frontier in Europe pretty, um, you know, tough. Uh, conflicts will be still there. Russia would be weakened, but it wouldn't uh, bring st this whole situation wouldn't bring stability into Europe. And uh, Russia would be very naturally tending to opt for a partnership, deeper partnership with China. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the most important things when thinking about China is about the viability of the current political regime there. And you know, the United States trade war has put a lot of pressure, I think, on China, but that pressure was already building up in the system. Um, the Chinese economy has reached that sort of in inflection point where it's going to have to go through significant restructuring, significant pain before it can emerge out the other end and have a modicum of stability. The problem with that, of course, is that in the same way that uh, you talked about how you know Russians come to value security. I think that for the Chinese, they have come to value social stability. If you're trying to understand culture, that's one of the most important things. And to pull off this type of economic transformation, uh, they sort of need a stronger political regime in order to maintain that social stability. And when I look at China, that's what I see with Xi Jinping. I see this kind of emerging dictatorship. I see this really unassuredness, you know, is China really just going to be the Chinese nation? Or is it a collection of ethnic groups? Is there some kind of um, you know, idealistic or commun you know, communism is something that is being talked about seriously again in China in a way that it hasn't been since Deng Xiaoping. Um, so, you know, I look at this from across the Pacific. You uh, in Russia, you're, you, you share a border with China. When you look into China, do you see a political regime there that is fundamentally stable, one that you think is going to be there 5, 10, 15 years down the road? Or do you see that this is kind of an unstable situation and as much as possible, you have to be ready for significant transformations inside the country. Well, historically speaking, uh, we see one of the most stable Chinese governments, which is uh, which can self-educate, which can learn by mistakes, which can learn from the mistakes of a partner, say Soviet Union. They managed to transfer between different epochs. They introduced capitalism while maintaining the primacy of the Communist Party, and uh, this is not something which is absolutely, you know easy to do. And um, I think they are able enough, capable enough to, and attentive to themselves enough um, to become one of the most um, uh, flourishing and uh, uh, prospering out of the globalization process. They build one of the biggest internal markets on the planet. Their trade with the United States is significant, but not that much significant. This trade war that Donald Trump is leading over China is not affecting that much the Chinese GDP and growth rate. And uh, I think they are becoming or become became actually the um, center of very natural center of world gravity, which uh, is stable enough and uh, constructive enough, uh, but lacks diplomatic and military experience. And uh, the open question is, 
um, can you actually contain a power like that by means that, say, United States is implementing in the Pacific? And wouldn't this provoke tension, and or including military tension, uh, prematurely? So I actually believe that uh, China is much more stable than China than we have observed like um, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, it is in one of the most um, uh, like dominating position regionally. And uh, Russia saw different kinds of China throughout this history of interacting with it. And currently we assess that it is one of the most um, stable government and one of the most prosperous society. If you visit the Moscow's airports, which are transit airports for Chinese to go to Europe and, uh, and into some other places, you see that uh, Chinese tourists are currently um, one of the biggest group there. So this is very well-fed society which uh, starts to produce uh, tourists who goes to Europe for attractions, for, for, for luxury. And this means that uh, it is not the country that we saw like 20 years ago, which was pretty poor still. That has to make Russia uncomfortable, though, then. Well, you know, Russia is always uncomfortable with something. <laughs> and we just live in the geography which we border like everybody. Uh, this week's crisis can be about North Korea. Next week's crisis can be about Georgia. Then next crisis, Ukraine, and uh, you name it. Um, so, uh, you know, we are not an island. I would prefer actually American geography to be like uh, somewhere in the ocean with two good neighbors and uh, being able to, to neglect the security challenges that you have. Well, you just need to be, uh, you need to be concerned with uh, what's going on around you, being attentive about it and try to build partnerships that uh, strengthen your security. And I think this is what is going on in Russia, Chinese relations. All right. Well, we've been talking for 30 minutes now, Andre, so we should probably wrap it up. But before we do, I, I've been peppering you with questions for most of this conversation. I wonder if there's any topic or any question you wanted to throw back at me or anything you wanted to explore more deeply that we didn't in our conversation so far. I actually have one and put it a big one. The thing is that we have a symmetry of perception, I think. Uh, while Americans uh, still believe that Russia interfered in the American elections, and uh, as I spoke with different people in Washington, everybody have almost, you know, uh, they perceive it as a vital threat. It's almost act of war. So Russia interfered in our elections. And uh, they consider that the sanction regime is... Uh, uh, that that is being imposed on Russia is, um, you know, something small comparing to what Russia has actually done in these elections. While here in Moscow, people are not, you know, um, they lost a causal sequence, what have been the cause and what have been the effects. Uh, they didn't see at any point that some kind of, you know, operation that can actually show a flag that, you know, we can... Uh, probably do to you what you what we think you are doing to us almost always uh you like the idea was probably to force people to negotiate how we should stop it jointly how we should stop it simultaneously and they see this you know growing sanctions as a classical american uh, strategy towards russia or soviet union deter and then probably dismantle and uh, they see that, uh, you know, a strategic consequence would come out of it. Um, so the question is, what would you say or what would you advise for a Russian foreign policy statesman uh, here in Moscow to do to, you know, make this perception in, in Washington, um, to change this perception about the possible Russian participation in this election meddling, or how to, how to uh, fix this perception gap? Yeah, the it's a in some ways it's a difficult question. Uh, the election meddling has always confused me because um, I'm sure that there was some meddling. I don't think anybody would deny that there was some meddling, but the idea that the United States does not also meddle in the internal politics of other countries and Russia uh, via whatever you know NGOs or its relationships with the media or you know we can go through a long laundry list of things uh, it's not like this is new that countries like Russia and the United States like to try and push influence and and make things go in a particular direction in in a way that they think is either strategically beneficial for them or that will create some kind of underlying level of chaos um that's just the nature of political competition in some sense um i think one thing that you see is that the united states though is it's very on the one hand, insecure, and on the other hand, very internally divided. 
Um, so the the meddling has has been used as a political talking point on both sides, and it has become something larger perhaps than it was in terms of its actual effect, in part because there are such deep divisions in the United States about domestic issues as much about what America's role in the world is supposed to be. Um, I think one of the amazing things about the amazing things when you're thinking geopolitically about the Trump administration versus the Obama administration is you've had some real policy changes with the Trump administration. Often in US foreign policy, things basically just continue on under a different administration. The Trump administration sees the world differently than the Obama administration. It pursues things differently than the Obama administration. Um, if, if, if you're sitting in Russia and you're trying to figure out what's going on in the United States, look, there are certain key issues that the United States is always going to be obsessed with. Um, the United States wants no part of, first of all, it wants no part of jihadists inside the greater Middle East, but the United States is also very nervous about any kind of push for regional, regional hegemony in the Middle East. Um, so for the United States right now, that's Iran. I've, I have written before that I think that that is perhaps a little bit misplaced. You have talked about countries making mistakes. I'm not sure Iran is the greatest threat to becoming a regional hegemon in the in the Middle East, but that's what the Trump administration sees right now, and that's the way the United States is behaving. Uh, in Europe, look, the United States is pursuing a policy where uh, it's you know it, it it's forging close ties with Eastern Europe, and it it feels like Russia is trying to push into some of these regions, and it feels like it can't communicate with Russia on any kind of level. To where you know Ukraine has become an issue, and uh, the Balkans have become an issue. All these other things. Um, I guess that look the the way to change the perception is to try and somehow both sides are going to have to compromise and the United States is the stronger power so Russia is going to have to decide what is most important to it and if it can say okay like you know perhaps if we can come to some agreement on Ukraine and resolve the situation in a way that is satisfactory to both sides and giving up something on the one end then maybe you can create a, a positive momentum uh, for improvement of relations or for strategic dialogue. I think you have someone in the White House who is open to that. The problem is, has always been that every U.S. president for the past four administrations has been open to that. Uh, you know, Obama wanted to reset relations with Russia and George Bush wanted to reset relations with Russia and even Bill Clinton wanted to reset relations with Russia. So the problem there is is really clearly articulating to the establishment what Russia's concerns are, what its red lines are, and what it absolutely needs, and then trying to forge a basis for communication. And the difficult part of the answer is to say, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if that if that Cold War hangover, or if the way that US politics is currently structured, if you can do that. A, a good example is the way that the United States has turned against China. Um, there is a significant amount of domestic feeling in the United States and has been going back to the 1950s ever since Mao came to power, uh, that China is a major threat. And no matter what China says, no matter how many op-eds the People's Daily writes about, you know, all we want is peaceful development and all we want is, you know, economic benefits for both sides and we'll make a deal, just talk to us. You're going to have this kind of elemental uh, political faction with the United States that is against it. And if you look out in the world, you can find plenty of examples of China militarizing and that then it creates a momentum of itself. So I don't know, did I answer your question, Andre? I, I'm not sure that there's a good a good way to do it, but I think trying to solve some of these outstanding issues in in some way is, is the way to try and create momentum there. Well, yes, I think that this strategic competition um, is not the same as the frontal confrontation we had during the Cold War. And uh, it's not necessary for us to confront each other on every, all and every issues that we have in the agenda. So hopefully that would become a common knowledge in, in, in a few years. But still, yeah, this Cold, Cold War hangover is there. It's it's there. Although the 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 one sort of positive or the one silver lining that I see in all this is, look, the, the Cold War was very much an ideological conflict as much as it was a geopolitical conflict. And we can yes. talk about what came first, or but you know those were the Soviet Union, and the United States had very very different views, a about what the world should look like, and b about their country's role in sustaining that that worldview. Uh, the United States worldview was global and the Soviet Union's worldview was global and they were competing on that basis. Um, 
I think that, you know, I don't think Russia thinks that way anymore. What Russia wants is security for Russia inside of its current borders. And as you know, it, it will, it doesn't matter if, if you're communist or nationalist or anything else, as long as you are able to communicate with Russia and respect its interests. As for the United States, I think one of the things you're seeing in the United States is you're seeing fatigue. You know, the, the neoconservative experiment in Iraq where, you know, the U.S. was going to spread democratic values all over the world blew up in that administration's face. And the United States is tired of of doing that kind of thing. You see that push to to isolation. It's I'm not saying the United States is isolationist. It can't be because it's so powerful. But there is a strain within U.S. foreign policy that wants to separate itself off from the world. And I think the United States wants to do that right now. Um, I, the United States has certain values that it's not going to um, renege on. But at the same time, um, ultimately, the U.S. is trying to move towards a place of defining its interests. And I think the biggest problem with the United States right now is it has trouble defining those interests. The, the best ex we were just we were talking about the Balkans, right? Um, you know, the United States wants to welcome Macedonia into uh, the NATO Security Alliance, but until they have a referendum on what the name of their country should be, they can't be let into NATO. I mean, on a, on a pragmatic, yeah. realistic basis, that's absurd. Like, if Macedonia is an important country and if it's strategically important to let Macedonia into NATO, then let them into NATO. Then pressure Greece to let go of the issue. And say there are bigger considerations here, but you know the United States and the West has these things where it's like, well, no, because if we do that, then there's problems, and it's going to separate everything, and then we're going to be fighting with each other, and we just can't do that. So, look, the, the United States has to decide for itself whether it wants to be that sort of global power and wants to push a value system all around the world, or if it is willing to behave and think of itself like any other nation. And I think this gets back to what you were talking about, sort of intellectual inertia. It is very hard for countries not to think of themselves as unique and as having a particular role in a particular moment in history. And the United States is, is I don't want to call it the worst offender. It has the most power. So it's thinking about it in that way the most. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what I would say to that. Yeah, yeah. I would actually agree on this. Okay. Well, Andre, thank you. It was uh, wonderful to talk to you. I hope that listeners... Um, you know, Andre and I don't agree on everything, but I think we see the world or try to see the world in a dispassionate way, in a way that is divorced from politics. We're just trying to figure out what's going on in the world. And I hope that these two perspectives from very different parts of the world uh, have helped our listeners think through some of these issues a little more clearly. So Andre, thanks. We'll have you on again soon. Thank you, Jacob. It was a great opportunity. For more information about geopolitical futures or to sign up to receive our analysis, please go to geopoliticalfutures.com. Thank you.